Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheimer. Today, we're discussing autism and how both children and adults are living full lives with different manifestation of this, uh, this attribute of, of autism. Our special guests today are Patrick Paul, Executive Director and CEO of the Anderson Center for Autism in New York, and Daniel Openden. Uh, President and CEO of Southwest Autism Research and Resource Center in Phoenix, Arizona, and Brad Boardman, Executive Director of the Morgan Autism Center in California. Thank you all for joining us. This is just great to have you here. I'm, I'm so excited to, to talk with you about this really important topic. Very glad to be here, Mark. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's 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 wonderful. So I'm going to set you up, and I, and we'll go over to you, Patrick. <laughs> April is World Autism Month, and we wanted to honor all who live with autism, all who serve those who live with autism and support the autism community. The CDC currently estimates that approximately one in 36 children aged eight years old in the United States is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, ASD, and of those 4% are boys and 1% are girls. So it affects uh, uh, boys more than girls. And it's striking that we are we are finding more diagnoses. And, and that has led to some concerns about what is the cause of autism and and uh, how it manifests and so on. So, uh, Patrick, let's let's uh, go to you first. Let's talk a little bit about what autism is and why there seems to be a greater diagnosis. Are we becoming more aware as we analyze this condition? Are we becoming more aware of what the constituent parts of autism are? Yeah, um, you know, uh, autism is a developmental disability, um, and it's, um, it's uh, something, it's around the world. It's, it's not just in the United States. It's not just in developed countries. Uh, we, we, uh, we provide uh, a training and, uh, and services around the world. So, so uh, it's, the surveillance may not be as, as good in those other countries, but, but there's, there's suspicion that it, that it, pr it produces itself or, or, uh, or it presents itself as often in other countries as it does in the United States. Uh, one in 36 is a new diet is a new number that's come out. Um, uh, we started a radio show many, many years ago. That was one in 88. And we've had to change it progressively over the last 10 or 12 years. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that long. And now we've changed it uh, more recently to one in 36. So if it gives you an idea of, of how, how often uh, that statistic is changing, how new information is being presented, uh, it gives you an idea and how, uh, how quickly this seems to be moving and, and how, how many families and people, and communities uh, and individuals that this is impacting. Um, as far as why the diagnosis is occurring, uh, you know, we, we get a lot of reasons why um, that that uh, that are presented to us from science, and uh, and um, I don't know if people have exactly figured out what what that is. Uh, you know, the puzzle piece has always been something that's been presented as uh, as uh, you know trying to figure out exactly what's going on. But I think we're still trying to figure out why it's happening more and more as 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 time goes on, or is it to surveillance, or is it the fact that it's being diagnosed more? Uh, you know, it's 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 sort of up in the air. Anderson, as an organization, we do research. Research. Uh, we provide services. Uh, we do training. Um, uh, you know, we're on the uh, on the, the side of, of service delivery. Uh, even though we work with research, uh, it's, the research we're doing is on treatment. It's not on on cause or, or. But we do work with other organizations that are working with that, and we we provide information to them as as they as they ask, and we involve our families in that and in, in that research that's looking for a cause. But but it is out there. I mean, we're, we're not exactly sure. Um, uh, but Anderson, like I said, our focus is really on on services and treatment for individuals with autism and their families. Danny, I wonder, as uh, you know, in terms of if you take a look at my own family history and you take a look at people who I know, there are people throughout uh, my family and throughout um, our, our broader circle of friends and their families and so on, who now in, re in retrospect, we could uh, say that, you know, maybe they were affected by some form of autism, but we didn't know it at the time, Right. So I feel like over, over time, I, as I become more aware of ASD, as I become more aware of those attributes, my, my own layperson's 
sort of interpretation of data, a diagnosis of data has shifted. Is that what has gone on over the last 10 and 15 years? Have we become more aware, more capable of understanding those attributes that can be ascribed to ASD? Yeah, I think I think that's uh, I think that's absolutely what we're seeing more of. I, I agree wholeheartedly with Patrick. No one has the full answer to this question or why we've seen this big increase in the number of kids diagnosed with autism. And at the same time, we know at least in the more recent years that uh, that the numbers have continued to rise largely because we've been better able at identifying autism. We have a lot more awareness. We have better detection methods. Uh, we're working on screening programs with pediatricians, with schools. Uh, that's something that Sark has been really active with as well. Um, we also know that there's something called diagnostic substitution, right? So kids that maybe would have gotten a uh, a uh, intellectual disability impairment or maybe childhood schizophrenia uh, decades ago are now being identified as having autism. And then finally, we're, we're also seeing a, a, an increase in the number of kids with more mild forms of autism, uh, which, which is probably what you're getting to a little bit, Mark, is that you can kind of look back at this and go, well, maybe they were on the spectrum. And at the same time, it's important to remember that there is a whole large uh, population, probably one in the out of every 250 uh, Americans that are experiencing really profound autism as well and have really severe needs. And we need to make sure we don't have them overlooked as well. One of the things that that one of my early experiences, Brad, was uh, when I was in college as a fresh uh, as a freshman, um, there was a, a um, young person who exhibited certain behavioral attributes that caused others around to um, to mock him and to uh, treat him in a very in a very poor way. I was not one of those, but I did not go to his defense as I would today because I was mystified. It was these these behaviors were were so um, they, they were so out of the uh, out of the uh, norm and I didn't know what to think. And I, by the time I sort of gathered my thoughts and so on, he was he he had left the school. Um, so I I look at that with a lot of regret, um, and I I look at that as the people who were mocking him were not evil people; they just didn't understand really. Yeah, it's funny, Mark. I have a very similar story to yours. In middle school, I I knew an individual who was kind of in the same situation, and. Um, and so that understanding has come a long way in the years since you and I were back in school um, in some really great ways, I think. I think for for me as a as a director of a school program, an adult program, you know, it's always been really important for me to provide our students and adults with opportunities to integrate and, and work with um, their peers who may be neurotypical, et cetera. But even more important, and this is kind of my evolution over time, is it's it's really important for those neurotypical kids to really have a chance to interact with us and get to understand what what defines autism, what the challenges are, and how to support people with autism. That's such an important point, right? It's it's advantageous for us to extend ourselves beyond our knowledge base and to extend ourselves beyond the norm, right? Because who knows, we can we can actually learn something from that experience. So let's talk a little bit about how you provide your services because what you basically do is you galvanize a community to help others in the community, right? Each of you d- takes your own cut on this. So let's let's go through your uh, your programs, Patrick. If you could give us uh, a, a a real summary of the kinds of services that you provide, and then Danny, and then Brad, uh, because I think what we'll find is there's a lot of ex- intersectionality, right? Mm. Well, Anderson, Anderson, yeah, Anderson Center for Autism has been around. We're going to be celebrating our hundredth year. We we didn't always focus on autism, but probably for the last twenty five years, we've had a program that's grown into an autism only program. So that's all we serve as individuals, their families with autism. Um, and we support the community in, in helping to support those individuals and families with autism. Uh, we're located, uh, our headquarters are located uh, here in Statsburg, New York, which is north of Poughkeepsie in New York. Uh, we have a school program. Uh, we um, And we have a residential school program. We have an adult program. Uh, we do consultation in the school districts. Uh, we have telehealth. Um, we have autism insurance program. We do preschools. Uh, we have uh, approximately 
a thousand employees all together that are providing services. Um, and in our adult program, we have 25 uh, group homes in the community for lifelong learning centers. Uh, we train people from around the world, 80 countries and, 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 and increasing. We do consultation across the world to many of the countries um, that, that, that we actually get trainees from. Um, and uh, we're, we're very focused on uh, quality of life, uh, optimizing the quality of life of, of, of individuals with autism around the world. Uh, we have a school program here. We take children from all over the country, uh, California, uh, Illinois, New Jersey. You think about it. We, 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 we have them here. Uh, and we really, and I want to touch on what Danny says, uh, on our campus, uh, in, our, in our adult program that we have, residential program, we really do serve the most profound individuals uh, who have autism. And, and that's about 27% was the last data point that I've gotten uh, that have profound autism. And I, and I never want to forget those folks uh, because because sometimes people think about the person they met in school. We talked about that. I had somebody I met. I, I'm absolutely sure they had autism, you know, and they had some some of the same uh, obstacles that you folks are talking about. But but there there is a group of individuals that really have significant uh, issues. Uh, they have significant challenges uh, that they really need a lot of support. Some of them self injurious. Some of them also um, are, are can be aggressive, uh, and they have a lot of co co comorbid conditions that are associated. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so, so that's just a group of folks that we serve. We also serve people in school districts. We serve people at home insurance. So those are the folks who are less profound people who are more the types that you would have seen, uh, when you were in school at the time, people in the community, uh, that, that live more independently. Um, and, uh, we kind of go across the gambit. We, we, we service a lot of people from a lot of places and, uh, and we're, we're very, uh, we're happy to do that. And Danny, do you do you run the entire gambit as well? We do. We do. So yeah, I'll, I'll zoom way out and tell you that Sark's vision is people with autism meaningfully integrated into inclusive communities. And you'll see how our program offerings sort of all lay into that vision as well. So our, our earliest program is, is called our, our community school, which is an inclusive preschool program for children with autism integrated with typically developing students. And these kids, um, you know, you've got half with autism, half without. And those kids without are going to be future classmates at schools, teammates on sports teams, one day employers or coworkers, maybe even employees of people with autism as well. You're you're modeling society the way it should work, right? Where, yeah. where we are a real America, which includes all of its citizens, right? And we're taking care of each other. Yeah, that, that's right. And it starts for us in our community school. Um, but um, we also have a, a four week program. It's sort of your intro to autism. We call Jumpstart. Uh, we provide lots of services in the home, school and community. So wherever to your point, Mark, wherever you see typically developing kids, teens or adults, that's where SARC people are working as well. Uh, and then uh, we also provide services for those teens and adults, too. We have a program called Community Works, uh, which is really about um, pre-employment opportunities for teens with autism partnered with various places in our community to learn uh, job skills. And then uh, in, with our adult services, uh, we're, again, helping them integrate and live as independently as possible. So we have an employment services program. Uh, we partner with our, um, our sister nonprofit called First Place, which is a residential program for people with autism. We provide what's called the First Place Transition Academy. It's a two-year program that works on developing the independent living skills uh, of adults with autism to live independently after two years in the program. We're actually enrolling for that program right now for the new school year all across the country to be able to offer adult young adults that as well. And then what I, last, what I would tell you, Mark, is that we like to say that at SARC, we are as committed to improving the behaviors and skills of people with autism as we are to improving the behaviors and skills of the communities in which they live. And uh, and our focus, as much as we focus on people with autism, we're working with businesses, we're working with employers, with schools, with after school providers, with police officers, with recreational providers to find ways to better integrate people with autism into our communities. And we see this. We, we've done searches for organizations that serve the autism uh, community in in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, Providence Center or Albertina Kerr in in Oregon or uh, Hope Services or. Uh, community gay path, ability path now, um, we're, we're actually seeing this kind of an integrative approach gaining more and more traction rather than, Brad, segregating populations. You're basically um, accepting and embracing 
uh, people and and looking at this as a bi-directional educational opportunity, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, at our core, we are a school and adult day program for for individuals. We the the students and adults we serve tend to have some pretty extensive support needs. And so our school program is actually a one-to-one program for every student who's on our school campus, there's a staff person. That's the the level of support that our students really require. 90% of our students are are nonverbal. So communication is a really big push for us. And we utilize a lot of technology knowledge to to help us with with teaching these individuals how to how to communicate their wants needs and and beyond um yeah and so a very supportive model but also we understand the limitations of that too and so we want our students and adults to have community experiences and get out and interact with peers and so on so we have a reverse mainstreaming program for our school where we have relationships with private schools in the area and have kids visiting our campus and interacting with our students. Um, and of course, our adults are out in the community interacting with, with everybody out in the community. So super important. What is, what is the biggest change that we have to have in ourselves in terms of our own uh, attitudes? Uh, one of the things that, that I've detected in myself is that if I don't get what I, uh, what I feel emotionally is, is uh, the norm in terms of interactions with somebody, I tend to blame that other person, right? I want to have the feedback, the, you know, the communication, the verbal, as Brad said, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of people who have severe autism are not verbal, right? I want to have that verbal interaction. I'm not getting it. I blame that person. It's not me. It's them. But maybe it's me. Danny, what do you think? I mean, do I have to, think more expansively about about my own interactions, how I move through the world. Um, If I'm going to take advantage of the gifts that somebody is offering me, maybe it's a nonverbal gift. Maybe it's a different way of being. So, Mark, I had a great story that answers that question um, directly. We have, uh, uh, over the last year and a half, created a self-advocate advisory board. These are adults with autism advising the organization on our marketing programs, research, services, et cetera. And uh, about six months ago, we were discussing one of our teen programs, which is called Peers, that teaches social skills to teens with autism. And um, and for the first time, we were getting a lot of pushback from this group of people uh, on the spectrum and asking a lot of tough questions about what we were doing. Um, and as we continue to talk through of it, finally, we kind of had this breakthrough uh, where somebody said, you know, social interactions take place between two or more people. Yet the burden of making those social interactions successful often relies on people with autism, the very people with a disability that are trying to learn these social skills. And then one of them, uh, another one raised his hand and said, you know, um, why is it that people without autism, why can't they simply meet us halfway? And we have been really trying to share this story with our community as much as we can, because um, we do exactly what you said, Mark, like we've got people with autism across the lifespan that work so hard to develop the skills to be successful in our communities. They need us to meet them halfway. And in some of the cases of the people that Patrick described that he serves and Brad uh, serves at the Morgan Center, we actually need people to go more than halfway for to meet some of these people as well. So I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to make sure that we understand that people with autism are working hard to develop these skills and we've got a responsibility as a supportive community to meet them halfway to help them be successful and integrate into our communities. Patrick, I want to ask you a question about uh, about my conduct as somebody who employs people. Um, I had a situation in which um, I was looking for a particular uh, uh, type of, of individual. And in my business, we recruit nonprofit leaders like yours, like you and, and members of your team and so on and so forth. And we had somebody come in who was quite obviously on the spectrum. And it was very difficult for me to conceive of how to employ this person. And at the end of the day, I couldn't make that move, right? It wasn't that the person wasn't intelligent. It wasn't that the, but the communication issue where where we are interacting in rapid fire interactions like this was going to be an insurmountable issue. Um, 
I th- that that instance stuck with me because I feel that it's a failure on my not not because the analysis was wrong. The analysis was correct. The decision was probably correct, but I'm not part of a solution in that particular case. Mm-hmm. Right. So how do how do I shift? How do I end up making a positive um, uh, contribution that that allows my business to to actually function. How can I change, uh, Patrick? How do you counsel people like me to evolve my own attitudes and my own approaches to these things? Yeah, I mean, the way I've always looked at it f- for work and employment is uh, it, it has to be a right fit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, whether you have autism, you don't have autism, if you put somebody in a position where they're not going to be successful because of who they are, the way that right. they were brought up there. You know, it's just not going to be successful. So well, that's um, why I said it was probably the right decision. But, you know, just because you make the right decision doesn't mean that you're, you know, you don't process. And I think that you also have to extend yourself. You, you have to put yourself in the uncomfortable situations that are uncomfortable to you that maybe are not uncomfortable to the individuals who's who's approaching for the job. Give give an opportunity for for both folks to kind of figure out how they can make it work. Um, uh, and, and and like I said before, every individual who has autism is an individual that, you know, I, I, I there's certain things I'm not going to do. I, you can you can point to a lot of jobs. I am just not going to do it because I don't like heights. I don't like uh, loud noises. I don't like a lot of things. That's not the job for me. But but we, what we have to do is we have to find uh, where where the, the individual is 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 finds the spot where it works for them like anybody else. Uh, and maybe take a little bit more time, a little bit more effort. Uh, you have to extend yourself if you're an employer a little bit more to accommodate certain things. Uh, and, and, and don't get me wrong. I, I think we do it all the time for people anyway. I just don't think that we look at someone with autism and realize it's just the same accommodation, a little bit different. Um, uh, right. There may be somebody who, who approaches you who, uh, who, who potentially may have a physical disability or, or maybe has some medical needs that you need to sort of work on. They may need to bring their dog to, 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 to work because their dog is, uh, is, is some sort of therapy animal. Right. We all make ways to make that happen. But sometimes when you have somebody with autism come through the door and they want to do something, it's something that maybe is not as usual as people normally have to make make accommodations for but it's something they can probably do in many cases especially if that individual is interested in doing that and has some prerequisite skills brad what is your answer to this i i mean i would say it goes beyond you mark i i think um you have to build a culture too at your workplace where people are looking at at what individuals are able to do and contribute to your organization rather than just maybe um, seeing maybe a social um, challenge or something like that. So you really want to build a workplace where everyone is really looking at people for the value they can provide. I agree with Patrick that you, you gotta you gotta find the right fit too. Um, there's no sense in putting someone in a position where they're gonna fail, but Sometimes you have to stretch a little bit and get your your coworkers and everybody else to stretch a little bit to accommodate someone who's really going to provide some amazing value to the organization. And I think that that in order to stretch, you also have to be hard nosed about it. I mean, what you what you're what you're saying is you should you should stretch, but it's got to work, right? You yeah. have to be really good at making things work and work well. Because if what you're doing is you're creating an accommodation that won't work for the person, won't work for the organization, won't work for the clientele, you're not helping anything. You're basically um, you're basically trying to twist everybody into a pretzel in a way that's that's completely dysfunctional. It ha- you have to be better than that, right? You have to have a higher degree of skill in order to to make it work for society, and that's that's sort of the same situation for for the United States. Let's talk, Brad. We're going to go around. We're going to we're going to uh, we're coming to the end of our time, so we're going to go around the room one more time uh, with Brad. We're going to start with you, and then Danny. We're going to end up uh, with Patrick. Talk about how you see your organizations evolving in the next several years. What kind of initiatives are that particularly stand out, and what kind of needs do you have going forward? Well, uh, so I've been doing this for now thirty years, and in the time that I've been with Morgan Autism Center. 
it's become very apparent to me that individuals with those extensive support needs, um, especially as they age and they get into adulthood, the options, the really good options for them um, to be a part of their community and participate and do meaningful work and those kinds of things um, drops off in some pretty big ways. And so adult day programming, um, those kinds of services, I think they're just going to have to get better and they're going to have to start accommodating these these children who are growing up and, and ed- exiting the education system, essentially. Um, you know, not everyone at exits the education system and can go off and get a job. Some of these individuals really do need um, the support of a, a day program or something like that. And so I, I see that um, for us as an organization, that's that's something that we really want to push. And by the way, we find this same point mirrored across different sectors. We find it mirrored across child care, elder care, uh, people with various conditions, physical conditions, uh, mental health issues. We have a, a situation in which we have an aging society. So caring is going to be, it's not just autism, right? This is, in a sense, autism is just part of the group that requires, uh, you know, a lot of care. By the way, Danny, um, we just did uh, uh, several polls. One, we found that two thirds of the people who responded um, either are directly affected or indirectly affected uh, by uh, ASD in some way through their family and friends. The other uh, poll that I thought was really interesting is we asked, what do you think are the most challenging aspects of living with uh, with autism? And we found that there were three. It's interesting. Stigma. In other words, stigma of of people who are not who who, who are not aware of autism. Uh, Financial hardship. Really, really important. And then safety, safety all around. Right. Very interesting. And then we also um, have the the last question, which is interesting. It's about support. And, and it looks like the vast majority of people think that it is an all of society uh, issue, you know, which really mirrors, Danny, what you said, what Brad said and what Patrick has said. Um, could you just give us uh, an orientation on, on what's next for Southwest Autism Research and Resource Center? Sure. So we've set a strategic plan that by 2030, SARC will become a statewide organization that puts effective services within reach of every Arizonan. And uh, there is a part of that is very focused on our physical location. So we're going to go from four campuses to nine spread throughout the state by 2030. Uh, We're in a, a silent phase of a capital campaign to be able to make that possible now. But we know it's not just the physical locations that we need to focus on. Uh, we need technology as a way to be able to get there. So we have an app called Think Autism that we want to get in the hands of more people to get people identified at an earlier age, and particularly in schools when they get messed by their pediatricians. Uh, we know we need to work on public policy changes, and we know that we need to continue to work with building out our inclusive, supportive communities uh, for people with autism as well. Um, and then finally, uh, as we look at adults, uh, you know, we've been saying this for years, but it's somewhere in the range of about, you know, a half million uh, or, or 50,000 people a year are entering adulthood. And they're going to be adults much longer than their uh, children. And uh, and so we're very focused on how we build out the right systems, processes, programs and communities to support uh, adults with autism and to help them live as independently as possible. In fact, a major initiative for us over the last four or five years that we see going forward is we have to be able to quantify outcomes for people with autism. And we're actually learning how to do that by working with adults with autism because we're looking at what their outcomes are going to be. And what we used to look at a three-year-old and say, what are they going to be like at six? Now we're looking at a three-year-old and say, what are they going to look like at 33? And trying to measure our outcomes based on that. And they're all centered around trying to maximize independence uh, for people with autism as much as possible. I think Arizona is a very interesting model. I'd like to stay uh, connected with all of you. And and in in this initiative, um, Arizona functions as a bullseye, right? Where you have Phoenix, uh, Scottsdale, um, uh, Tucson being sort of the population center, maybe arguably Flagstaff, Prescott, and so on. But um, uh, beyond those, those urban centers, People are widely dispersed to provide a statewide solution. We're doing the same thing in Colorado with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, it's a very interesting model, which has a lot of resonance throughout the United States. 
So thanks for sharing that. Patrick, what's what's next uh, in New York for the Anderson Center for Autism? Well, um, well, we serve everybody across the country uh, in one way or another, whether it's telehealth, it's uh, people coming and receiving services on our here, here in New York. Uh, we continue to expand. Um, um, we're actually going out to, to do a little bit more of the autism supportive environment work that we do in California and, and, and other places. Um, we're more on the international front right now. We're, we're actually um, we're doing consultation to Saudi Arabia. We're doing consultation to um, to India uh, on, on really developing services there for uh, it's a completely different way of providing services. And uh, it's 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 something that we've been working on for years. Um, and we're, we're expanding our, our footprint further with relationships with other organizations throughout uh, the world. So. So and, and inside uh, the United States, uh, we're hoping to to actually expand out to a couple other states uh, providing service. Um, and so so I think that's going to be an interesting uh, next 10 years or so. And I'm excited about it. Well, serving international communities is such a sophisticated issue. We have, uh, as I think I said before the show, we have in, in our small group, seven different nationalities. We speak uh, six or seven different languages. You're talking about linguistic differences, uh, the the differences of medical systems. You have reg- regulations, societal attitudes. Yeah. Very complex, right? I mean, mm-hmm. when, when I speak with uh, with uh, 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 Zuki Waita, who comes from Kenya, um, and talking about uh, the the attitudes of the various countries in the continent of Africa. Right. And then you talk with um, uh, Joanna Nowatska, who's from Poland or, or um, you know, various other people, um, Oscar Kiros, who who is uh, from Mexico. You have this incredible complexity. I'd like to stay connected with you as well uh, in terms of of how you're going to reshape your organization to create this more uh, international footprint. And and Brad, you're you're in my neighborhood, so we can actually meet in person. That would what a concept. That'd be great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Patrick, thank you. Executive Director and CEO of the Anderson Center for Autism in New York, Daniel Openden, uh, President and CEO of the Southwest Autism Research and Resource uh, Center, and Brad Boardman, Executive Director of the Morgan Autism Center in California. Thank you so much for sharing thank you. the work of your, of your people, your community, your staffs, your volunteers, your families, your funders. It's been a really exciting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.